This podcast is being brought to you by the Stockton Masters of Instructional Technology Facebook page. If you would like us to make more segments like this, please let us know. Welcome to the Meet a Meet User podcast, where you'll find the human side to EdTech. I'm Elizabeth Rivera, and this is our second interview with our special guest, Nicholas Brennan. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Meet to Mate User Podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Rivera, and today we have a very special guest. It is Nick Brennan. They have been working very hard on some very awesome stuff as a video game designer. They're also working on a lot of amazing things as a mate student. Currently, he's in one of my classes called e-learning, and he's going to be talking a little bit about his journey of how he got into mate what happened before mates and how he's implementing the ideas now that he learned previously within the major and what he hopes to do once he graduates. So Nick, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, nice to nice to be on. Thanks for having me. Uh, Yeah, uh, as Liz said, I'm Nick. Um, I am in the mate program because I love technology and how that relates to learning. and so I'm getting my degree there to eventually uh, adjunct teach at either Stockton or elsewhere. Um, on my free time, I also make games. And some of those games are also educational. Uh, so I, yeah, I really like game design and game development uh, as well as uh, education. Well, that's awesome. That's a great introduction, Nick. So let's get this started. So the first question I have is, tell us how you got into Mate. So the the way I got into Mate is I heard about it from a friend, uh, Wayne, uh, who works in the tutoring center at Stockton. Uh, And it seemed like a really good opportunity because I'll be able to get more uh, ability to teach. Uh, when I taught at the high school for a year, I found that that wasn't really for me. Although I really liked lesson planning and delivering lessons, uh, the transportation issues I was having, coupled with the different kind of way that high schools are run with like a strict enforcement of discipline, things like that were hard for me to do. So At that time, I was trying to see what I wanted right now. I'm getting my master's degree to be able to do that. In the meantime, I'm building my skills in a lot of the more complex technical programs like Godot Engine, making games on the computer, like Blender, working on my art because I'm also a visual artist. And yeah, so I'm I'm just taking this time to to develop my skills that's awesome i think that's very interesting that you that you have a journey that is not what i expected so you worked as a teacher for a year in terms of that one of my questions is what is your biggest takeaway from your experience as a teacher and your student interactions what do you think is an important takeaway for those who are interested in teaching yeah so I guess I'll target this at people who would be like new teachers. So from my experience, uh, I was not uh, mentally prepared for the skills that I would need. And so what that meant for me was I really loved math and I and I still do. Um, and I really loved lesson planning. And so I thought it was going to be like this perfect career that I would be so happy with but when you go actually into a high school to teach there's a lot of disciplinary uh, skills that you need Uh, and I got some look at those through my clinical practice when I was an undergraduate I had to go into the schools but it's not the same as many people will attest to when you actually become the only teacher in the room and everything. And there's certain expectations about noise level and things like that. It becomes a very stressful situation, especially for someone who like me, who's very like sensitive to 
social stuff. And so it's a little bit difficult for me to to handle situations like that because I always want to be kind and gracious. And sometimes when it comes to discipline, you've got to be firm and, and strong. I did learn to do that. And I actually got really good at it by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't change the fact that it did stress me out more than I should have to deal with in my job. So I decided after finishing the year that I didn't want to continue along that path because it wasn't it wasn't right for me. Yeah, and I think that's very important when you realize that this may not 100% be for me and use it as a career shift. As a person who's been both a math teacher and a student, what do you believe are the biggest barriers to making math lessons more memorable and fun for learners? Math is kind of a very abstract thing. Uh, and this is seen throughout all the different lessons that people are given. Uh, right. In the high school level, some of these abstract concepts are so specific that it's hard to make a variety of different problems around these concepts. Right, so, right. for example, if you're talking about parabolic motion, the only thing you can really give as a real world example is something really flying through the air. I mean, there are ways to cleverly find other examples, but learners will get bored with that and not something that they can connect to personally as something important to them. Like, how often do you throw a rock through the air and want to know how far it goes? You just look at how far it goes. So a lot of math concepts like that are blocked by this real world context not being, although it exists, not being something that learners are interested in. There's a lot of like remedies for that and, and ways to deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite one is by making games. So you can make the game that kind of aids with the need for every single problem itself to be grounded in real world context. Because in the world of a game, if you bring someone into a world that you created, you can create real world contexts that are not stuck inside the context of just one problem, one math problem. So for right. example, you can make solving the problem have some sort of other context to it. Like maybe you're an adventurer and the magic that you do has to uh, rely on knowing math and and so so it kind of gives you like a like a a story like like a meaning um yeah right. so so that's something that can help I think that's a really great tip since in my experience growing up cool math games was so popular with a lot of people growing up because of how much fun it was to learn all ver a lot of various math concepts and how activities that were even arts related made people a lot more excited to apply a certain concept than doing the 16,000th problem, which was, oh, this person has this much money and they're trying to do this for their bank account, solve this problem. Problems like that just gets people really, really not engaged. I think that it does apply to instructional principles such as the principle within Allen's strategies because I know that Michael Allen's seven instructional strategies does mention how real life application is incredibly important but I find it interesting that you go for another route of the principles that if it's fun that might overcome the issue of the real life application in that realm what instructional principles do you believe are important for, for teaching math or creating the games that you're currently trying to create? Do you try to incorporate some of them in there? Yeah. So I will say this like making games thing is still like really new for me, especially when it comes to like educational games. I've only right. made one game that functions, uh, which is the unit circle game, um, which is a game that helps uh, learners memorize angles. Uh, so I'm still in the stage where all this is like new and exciting and I'm not really sure exactly where it's going to go, but I know that I 
really like making games and I want to see where that goes. There's a lot of things still up in the air when it comes to like the specifics. But one thing I will say is I, I really like certain topics in math. Mm. Uh, and I Which think, ones? yeah, so like trigonometry is a big one and also vectors um, because I think that they are very applicable to the real world in more wider variety of circumstances. And so that's where I'm going to be focusing my games on for however long to come. Mm -hmm. right. uh, when you think about trigonometry, you're thinking literally about like just the way things are facing, just turning things around and being able to describe things that turn. And, and you can also describe like lengths and, and how they relate to each other so it's actually like a really broad idea and, and it applies to so much I mean it's the foundations of, of of physics and and the same thing with vectors I mean vectors is huge in game development you can't do much when you're designing a game mechanic without vectors really why vectors, yeah well because with vectors you can uh, change the, the length of things. You can turn a vector. You can subtract two vectors from each other to get the, the line between two things. I mean, these are like the foundational like building blocks of everything you need to, to do anything, really. Hmm. If you want a character to be able to aim their like gun or whatever, you need the position of the character and then you need where they're aiming. And then that'll tell the the bullet where to go. So like everything in game development is is built on vectors and trig. And 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 when I was teaching this in high school, I saw these as such small units in the curriculum. And so I want to make games about these things to give people an avenue where they can learn more. Uh, yeah. So that's my ultimate goal. Yeah. I think that's super cool that you're into, into those topics. And honestly, I didn't know that when you think about it, trigonometry and vectors are all about perspective because usually when you see them in math problems, they seem kind of flat, like more so about objects being shot from a certain area or a certain point, like a basketball trying to get into a hoop, will it reach to hoop. It kind of reminds me of when you're trying to learn more and get an interesting concept. I read something recently where... People use Robert Plutchik's Wheel of Emotions. And I remember them, one of the writers of this article saying, oh, if you use anticipation to create a game of students, such as, oh, am I going to get this basketball into the hoop? But instead of just showing, oh, I'm going to show this basketball going into a hoop, I'm actually going to stop the ball at a certain angle. So you're forced to calculate if it's going to go into the hoop and then you're supposed to describe why you think it's going into the hoop or not and then mm -hmm. you watch it so if you play things out correctly and evoke emotions in the right way or motivations like making an adventure with magic in the right way it could really show the importance of how it can help you see different perspectives logically which i think it seems to me that's where the main bright spot of trigonometry and vectors are right it's the different perspectives that you can see just from I wouldn't say simple because not everybody mm -hmm. knows it as well as you do obviously but a as simple as a few mathematical formulas that you can just quickly solve and do inputs in right yeah the goal is to make it simple for sure because I mean I say it all the time I'll say oh just some simple vector math and then people will react in a certain way to that of course because it's something right. that's like complicated but um yeah once you get it it is it's it feels like such a powerful tool um and I, I love the example you just gave of the anticipation that was so cool yeah I I really need to look into more examples like that of ways that I can because I know in my head that I want to build uh, a game where where it can bring some real world context and some 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 emotion from the player into the math um, but yeah, I haven't gotten to that point. I'm still at the point where I'm learning these tools, learning how to make the game actually function, which I'm getting there. But yeah, yeah, it's 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 a process. Uh, and 
yeah, thanks for sharing that. That was really interesting to me. Uh, anytime. Thank you. I highly recommend for anyone interested to review the seven principles of Michael Allen because there is a principle specifically talking about emotions and how important evoking emotions are to make subjects that are usually seen as bland or mundane, such as procedures to do mathematical formulas, incredibly interesting. And the reason why I was mentioning Plutchik's emotional side is because you're saying, I want to add emotional grab to what, what people are doing in math. And I want people to get into computing things or maybe creating adventures or games at, at, out of math and have this connection. So with that being said, how do you decide what games you're going to create and how to create that connection. If I remember correctly, you have another game alongside the unit circle game that is a quite a big passion project that also kind of relates to it in another way because just as how vectors and trigonometry isn't 100% appreciated by people, certain creatures of the biological world, such as bugs like spiders, aren't necessarily the most appreciated either. So why did you decide a spider for your protagonist of all things for your other game yeah so this this connects a little bit to like identity and stuff i i really ever since i was a kid i really liked little monsters little like weird looking bugs and creatures mm -hmm. uh, i thought that they were cute and you know i still kind of do <laughs> i love creatures like that things that are things that are like different and yeah it it, it kind of helps me like uh like relate to them because I, I also have a feeling of difference like throughout my life with disability and with the way that I look and everything mm -hmm. uh it, it it just it gives me like a connection so I have a little bit of extra love in my heart for those creatures that are you know strange and unusual and so I wanted to share that in the the passion project that you said is spiders have four legs which is a very interesting name for a math person to come up with but yes. um <laughs> agreed because spiders yeah. have eight legs don't they why <laughs> they you do. why, why why did you cut it in half yeah well originally i cut it in half because it was easier to program um <laughs> but makes sense makes sense yeah <laughs> but i think naming it that way was an intentional decision because I want to bring the player to a world where nothing is as they expect. I want everything to be very weird and, and whimsical and, and, and something that you're not going to expect. So when you see a creature, it's going to be different than what you expect it to look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it, it's trying to uh, give the player like a, a, an appreciation for different so I'm just expressing that through the art that I make uh yeah it's funny that you say the thing about vectors because programming the legs the four legs is all vector math uh the 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 position of the knee the position of the foot I I actually get the vectors between those things and I actually construct the body of the spider with vector math Interesting. yeah okay yeah, that that's that's, that's one of the reasons I've become so passionate about vectors is because of how much I've had to use it in this project. I think that's very cool that you chose a spider for that reason. I also am in the camp of spiders are pretty cool, especially because I'm sorry, mosquito lovers, but since they spread malaria and other diseases, I think it's pretty cool that spiders kill a lot of mosquitoes that are really great natural pest controls. I also like Spider-Man, so go spiders. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think in terms of the identity and being allured by those that are different that's what brings a lot of allure for many to interests such as video games in general because there's a lot of stories that talk about oh you're different but you're the one that can save the planet or something like that and i and i think it's so incredibly gravitating especially because as someone who also has a, a, a disability i i have autism i also had that experience where I've been more attracted to characters that had different struggles that they were going through and were able to display them in such a way or, or utilize their struggles or their knowledge based on said struggles in a way that could actually impact things for the better. So I think that mm -hmm. having a spider that's already not just different because it's a spider, but has 
less legs than the average spider. I think that it's it's really evocative of of that theme. And I think that's really important. So I'm really glad that you, you mentioned the identity thing. With that being said, what do you think is the character that that is most uh, evocative of your video game passion or your video game creation style? Hmm. So I actually heard a lot of people, like if I got people to play the game in the early versions, uh, they gave me a lot of inspirations. They compared it to the things like Don't Starve, which is a game with kind of like a creepy 2D drawn style. People compare it to Limbo, uh, oh, all kinds yes. of things. Great yeah. games. Great Those games. are great comparisons. Yeah. And with your game, I saw that your game got featured at one point. What was the process of that like? Your your game had Don't Starve and those types of vibes. And then as your game grew as identity, it got presented. What was that like? How did you feel? It was were... it was crazy. It was such a fun time. Uh, the whole day I was watching, I, I got to see other people who were featured. Then I got to share my own little thing. Yeah, I, I was I was very excited. It was fun. Um. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm working on the the thing that was featured was actually just like a demo early version, and like currently as I'm developing my skills with game development, I'm still working in dreams to make the final passion project, get it out there, with all its new features as I've grown as a developer since then. <laughs> hmm. I find the whole idea of what, what you said to be very interesting that you're working on dreams and you're collaborating with a bunch of other people on there. For those who are not familiar with the video game platforms that you're utilizing, my one question is, uh, firstly, what is dreams? Because from what I know, dreams is not necessarily the main type of video game software that people think of when you think of video games. It, it works in a very interesting way that could connect different learning methods. So do you mind if you explain that? Yeah, so Dreams is actually a game that is sold on the PlayStation 4 and 5. And it has a very accessible uh, UI. And it's something that pretty much anyone can jump into and do something, whether it's making a 3D model or making some music or even making a whole game with enough practice and it's so much more accessible than the platforms on pc it's much easier to jump into and so that's where i found myself uh i uh remembered playing little big planet when i was younger which was another creative type game uh and so i looked into what the developers were making and they made another game called dreams and Dreams is kind of a natural uh, extension of these like kind of smaller game making things. Little Big Planet was more of a game and less of an engine. And Dreams is less of a game and more of an engine, but still a game. And and so I really like Dreams and it has taught me so many problem solving things and it's helped me develop my art. I do want to exit from dreams when possible because everything that's made in dreams is stuck in dreams. There's no exportation of games outside of dreams. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, the game that I'm making right now is only shareable with people who already own dreams and the PlayStation. So it's, 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 been this wonderful tool for learning about game design and development and it's will remain an important tool for proto prototyping games and getting myself my ideas because it's such a fast system i've made a uh, small experiences in under an hour before it's oh, wow. very fast yeah an hour, that's 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 pretty quick honestly it is um you can get mechanics and things like fleshed out very fast it won't look good it won't be anything like you dreamed of but it'll at least function in the bare bones uh very fast so that's why it's really good and I'll keep it in my toolbox 
for like prototyping a new idea, seeing how things work out. And then I'll have a better idea going into the other engines, how to make it how I want it. That's actually a really great point is the productivity side and the own ownership side of it. So with that being said, when you eventually are done with your games and you're done, you're done with Mate, do you ever plan to make your own video game company? Do you plan to just sell your games to larger systems to create more accessibility so other people can use it? Like, what, what do you plan to do with that? Yeah, so in terms of like my plan for the future, I haven't really looked into the different ways of getting games out there. I have heard of other game developers uh, putting their games on Steam. And so I think that's going to be my first goal is to make a game that I can put on Steam. Uh, and, and so, you know, once I, once I do that, it would depend on how those games do and, and things like that. Maybe a company would come, but really game development is just a passion of mine. Hmm. And I find the separation between the things that I love and my work life to be something that's valuable. Uh, so I would want to keep that distance so that I can just enjoy the things that I enjoy on my own time. Mm. And then, you know, everything work life can stay in work. <laughs> That's smart. I, I like that you have this work life balance separation because I find that a lot of people I've seen who become video game designers have a very hard time eventually balancing all the time and effort they put into making the game with the stress of when you work for a game development company company the deadlines like resources so it's it's smart that you're just taking your time with it and then transitioning it to steam so with that being said since you have some experience making video games what's your advice for those who want to get started with video games yeah i think um making a game is a huge task Mm -hmm. um, it requires skills in many different areas. It requires skills in sound design and music. It requires skills in visual arts. It requires skills in programming. For someone just getting into it, uh, I think the most important thing for them to think about is to just do the things that they love. And if it eventually becomes to a point where they develop all these different skills and they feel confident, then maybe go for making a game. And if you even get there, make sure that the game is extremely small in scope so that you can start small, make something so simple, because that's the only way you're going to really learn. Definitely, you have to love the process of doing it. If you don't like the process, you know, I, I don't think you'll get very far, especially if you're just starting out. Yeah, so right. find a way to enjoy what you're doing. I 100% agree with that. As someone who made their first video game for the gamification course, which we do have in Mates, we have a gamification course where you get to make your own video game. And I had a hard time starting them out because I did the mistake that you said. I made it way too large in scope. I was thinking, I'm going to do every single letter of the English alphabet, both uppercase and lowercase, do all 52 letters, be able to trace it. And then I realized very quickly, wait, I have to do the visual side of it. I have to make sure that the mechanics work especially and that nothing bugs out. Do it. I had to greatly decrease my scope and call it a proof of concept in order for things to work out. For those making educational games, what is your advice? I do know we have a course that made, as I just previously stated, that goes into that. But what's your advice for those who are either about to take the course or for those interested in gamification? What would be your advice to try to create an educational video game that's fun. So the way that it worked for me, and I think this is probably true for a lot of people, is there are certain topics that you teach in math and you kind of have a little extra love for them and certain lessons might go really well and you're like, wow, I feel like even though this went well, I have so many ideas to make it go even better. Like certain things really inspire you. And I think that's what you should look for when you're making an educational game. You mm -hmm. shouldn't try to make an educational game on just some random topic. It should be a topic that you really love, that you love understanding on a really deep level. 
Right. Uh, and you can you can pull inspiration from like your lessons and your way of presenting the information uh, in, in actual classroom environments. You can pull inspiration from my big point that I want to make is find find the topic that you really love learning and doing and then try to make a game around that. That's fantastic advice because if you're passionate about the subject that you're going to teach people with your educational game, it's going to show through the game and people are going to have an emotional connection. The same thing with teaching instructional design. If you have a passion and you have clear personal emotions and connections that you share with your students, a la Michael Allen's, again, seven strategies, seven success strategies, as well as Knowles's adult learning principles. If you share this, these personal experiences, people are going to be more likely to a- attach themselves to the subject and be willing to learn. So I 100%, I 100% agree. It's going to come through. When it comes to your current foray into video games, have your experiences as a teacher influenced your approach of creating educational video games or has may influence in any way? your creation of educational video games or how you interact with people in the gaming community? It definitely has. So the one game that I have made so far, the unit circle game, uh, I was always really passionate about trigonometry. When I was an undergrad, I was developing a new way of thinking about trigonometry. And then I eventually gave a talk about it at Stockton, which showed like the way that the unit circle is just one shape that you can trace out uh, different things and different functions with. I did the unit square and and all kinds of other things in the star, and I showed what curves would trace out from that. And so that was a fun talk. But yeah, I I really was passionate about trigonometry. And from there, uh, I started to teach uh, math. And one of the topics was trigonometry. And when I got to that topic, I was just so happy about it. And I was like, making these like cool ways for the learners to memorize the angles. And, you know, I remember being really happy one day that I put the triangles on the screen. I didn't give them anything. I didn't give them a number, nothing, just a shape of a triangle. Was Mm -hmm. it a really tall triangle? Was it middle triangle? Or was it a really wide triangle? And I had to decide, well, which angle is closest to this based on the shape. Stuff like that is like this very like, different way of thinking about it then led to uh the ideas that eventually went into the unit circle game uh because i was thinking about trig in kind of a different way than other people and i found that in the game it kind of helps with accessibility to think about it in this very visual way that's like not about the numbers it's more about like the shapes and the and the stuff like that it's something that anybody can grasp onto Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's that's how the the process of the like the unit circle game came to be. And then in May, that like those kind of like early adapted ideas kind of uh became more solidified because in one of our classes we had to outline a project using the Addy process, analyze, design, develop, implement and evaluate. When I was fitting the unit circle game into this process, it gave me a lot of more clarity on what the goals of the game were and, and what's the minimal viable product that I wanted to make, what, what's, the, what's the most simple bare bones version of this game, and what are the main goals. So it gave me a lot more like clarity. Uh, and I was developing the game during that process. So it was, it was good. Yeah. It it all came together in a really timely way, which was great for me. That's awesome. I initially like outlined the plan with, with Addy. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that it honestly, like I had been making games before and it's still in dreams. I was a little less experienced. I didn't make anything that was, you know, anything that would be shown or anything. I was just messing around trying to figure things out at that time but um I I found that the Addy process kind of meshed well with the kind of unnamed just in my head process I was doing just kind of messing around it gives you chances to reflect on what you're doing at each step of 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 the way going along 
And yeah, so so writing out the proposal for that project plan just gave me lots of times over the weeks doing it in the class to think back on the game, think on different parts and aspects that otherwise I might have glossed over or not thought about. So I think Addie served as like a good comprehensive, I guess, checklist, but also reflection engine, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, keep it in mind, folks, then if you're making an educational video game or you're about to take the make class, utilize Addy. That might help you a lot. Did you see any educational games on Dreams besides the ones that you were learning to create? There's a good number. Um, I will say a lot of the educational games lean less into the serious game theory by mm -hmm. Clark Abbott. It's more like fun with a little education sprinkled in, which is a little different than what I'm trying to do with the Unit Circle game. But yeah, there were mm -hmm. some games like that. There was there was a game called Binary Bash. There was a game called Nine Equals. There was a lot of games like that. I can't really think of any others off the top of my head, but they were out there for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Again, if you want to start off, Dreams is a really good educational platform. We got a PS4, a PS5. Now, you're also saying Godot you also use. So do you think that's also really accessible for people to learn? Godot is pretty accessible, but only in the context of standard game engines on PC, mm -hmm. which is to say they're not accessible to the average person who has no experience in game development in an engine that being said the skills that i learned from dreams and everything helped me transition a lot better there's also another game engine on pc that's called g develop that one is more accessible still difficult but more accessible yes. um so so if anyone's really starting out and they're really excited, they want to just try stuff out. I started with Godot. I find it really unique that you use it for a video game because usually when people think of Addy, they usually utilize it for their courses or learning resources that they're creating. So the fact you're using it for a video game is incredibly in interesting. How was the process of making a video game utilizing Addy different from making your average video game? And it was a little bumpy for sure. Oh, I think really? I, I spent at least 20 or 30 or 40 hours in Godot before I could make something that you could interact with. Ooh, Just interact with it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's such a powerful tool. It's open source engine. So it's always going to be improving over time. I mean, people from all around the world can find something that they want to improve on the engine and then no matter where they are, who they are, they can send it and it might be added to the engine. So, I mean, it's just a beautiful system. I think the future of Godot is very bright. And so that's why I chose to go into that engine, despite right. how difficult it is to learn. Sounds good. So for anyone listening, I, it seems to be that next tier list is if you're trying to learn, if you have PS4, PS5, Dreams at the top, then G-Develop would be a sec, uh, second slash First, if you're looking at the PC consoles and then Godot, if you're a little bit more experienced with certain aspects, that would be the third. That's a that's a really good tier list. Now, in terms of Dreams is aspects of learning from each other in social learning, I, I, I feel like that's a really important aspect to jump on because I know in previous conversations, correct me if I'm wrong, you took a lot of comments from other people who didn't just comment, oh, this game's like don't starve, but also said, oh, no. Here's some criticisms that maybe you can implement into your game. It's just like a such a strong community there. Yeah, uh, I think the Dreams community is very good when it comes to feedback. You're talking about a game engine where people make games every day. Every day, there's something new is coming out. And people sometimes jump onto Dreams just to play what other people made. Like, they don't always want to, like, create. So... The developers on Dreams, although they don't have the skills of a PC dev when it comes to programming and code and stuff like that, they provide feedback on so many games every day and are always thinking about game design. So they have very strong game design in them when it comes to what makes 
a good game. So so I think that's one of the big strengths of of dreams in the dreams community. They love giving feedback and and I mean it's just the it's a really good place for for prototyping. Not only because things are made fast, but because there's so many people who play games all the time who will gladly leave a comment that will like blow your mind when you see it if you're the person who made the game you're like wow this is exactly what this game means you know so stuff like that will happen right and then how how do you think there's any ways as a game designer do you believe aspects of how to foster a similar community for your modules that you create students faculty and subject matter experts do you have any ideas on that i think it all boils down to making it fun to talk about about these things. If you're thinking about a, a, a math problem or whatever problem you might be having in the day-to-day of a classroom, you know, giving learners avenues where they can think critically and share those ideas without any fears, not making them raise their hand all the time, although that can be useful, uh, giving ways that all types of learners can can participate and, and encouraging them to think uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a critical way allowing them to fail and then get feedback. I mean, all these things come together to make an environment where people really want to contribute. They want to to put their two cents in about different ideas. Even if uh, the, the feedback that the learners may give at the start isn't like this wonderful, mind-blowing thing, the process of constantly thinking critically and and being able to share your ideas develops a person. And that's what I see in dreams. Like people grow because they just keep giving ideas and they keep thinking about game design. That same thing can also happen in a classroom environment. I think that's incredibly important. And it's honestly eye-opening that that a lot of these skills that you're learning in dreams can easily be transferred to instructional instructional design now in terms of another aspect of instructional design have you incorporated visual design principles into your games in any way yeah i that's one of my other passions is visual design i love art um i took a class uh in may which i was so surprised at how many things i learned in that class and it was a visual design class Because I went into that class thinking that I was so good at visual design. Like, I've always done art ever since I was in high school. I painted, and then I did art everywhere. And then I went into this class, and it talked about these fundamental concepts that I had never heard about. (laughs) I had used them subconsciously, but never used, never heard and read and learned about them. And ever since I took this class, learning about these fundamental theories like uh, diagonal lines, horizontal lines, composition, uh, uh, the shape of of things can create feelings. Uh, uh, All these, all these ideas were wrapped up into this visual design course. And it made me feel more uh, conscious about my decisions with my visual design. And yeah, that's one of the classes I'm never going to forget. Yeah. Awesome. I'm happy to hear that you're incorporating visual design principles into your class. And it seems like that really inspired you. Have there been any learning theorists or pioneers who, while learning in mates, has greatly inspired you as well? I, I know you mentioned Addy. Any others, or do you think those are the main people who? All the theorists we've talked about in these classes have been really interesting. The one that really stuck with me was uh, Malcolm Knowles the adult learning thing, because I had been teaching in a high school and and feeling all these things. These learners are capable of thinking in this different way that I didn't learn about this. The theories of motivation is really important and stuff like that. Like I, we had lightly touched on that, but when I saw the adult learning, everything kind of started to click in my mind retroactively because... I was already done teaching that school year at this time when I was taking the class. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. How how fundamental these theories are and and how useful they are. I really do 
uh, recommend people look into them. The six attributes of an adult learner. Super useful, not only as uh, an educator, but also yourself. It, mm -hmm. It'll help you in your own life figure out, oh, you know what? My motivation is actually extremely important. And <laughs> if I spend two or three days trying to just find my motivation of what I want to do next, then that's worthwhile. I find that really interesting. Which principle do you think is your favorite out of Ma Malcolm Knowles' principles? The one that stuck stuck out to you the most? Because you, you said mo motivation, right? That's the one you think? Yeah, I think so. Motivation is a big one. All the other ones are great, but the one about motivation really sticks out to me because that's what influence behavior in learners and everybody. Motivation is where everything comes from. Thank, thank you, Nick. So I guess the most eye-opening thing you've learned and made thus far, it seems to me that you have a long list. Has Is there anything that sticks out to you like, oh my God, it's like a light bulb moment for you? Wow, I've gone through so many on the list. I, I think I might have to think back to some of the things I said. I think the one that really um, sticks out to me uh, was just going through the program. Uh, when I first entered the program, I was in a bit of a depression. Uh, and then Where I went into to therapy, actually. Uh, and uh, yeah, at the beginning, I was kind of struggling with feeling so nothing really matters, you know. And, yeah, so I, I was I was in a pretty bad depression. Uh, and then the therapy really helped me uh, work out this like workflow schedules and, and it helps me like write, keep thoughts clear and uh, keep me motivated and stuff. So yeah, I think just the process of going through the program for me was just something that kind of like it didn't wake me up on its own. The therapy also did that, but it just gave me a, a reason to fix things that were broken. <laughs> Sorry to hear that you went through that, but I'm so happy for you that you found a new way to get to get through that. I'm really happy for you, honestly. That's awesome. Um, yeah, sometimes all you really need is just a problem to be presented to you. And right. for me, it was the, the main program. I got to get through this program. And, oh. you know, at the time I was really depressed. And so the problem of finishing the program was a really helpful thing. So that, I, I think that's really what I'm trying to say. You've got a lot of interesting stuff that our listeners are very much enjoying, I'm sure. One, one question that I also have for you is on that same belt. As someone who's dealt with mental health struggles as well as uh, disability-based struggles, what do you believe is a great way to increase accessibility in the instructional technology world? The thing with uh, disability is it's so wide and varied. Um, and so I think technology and instructional technology, especially also e-learning, provides mm -hmm. so many uh, opportunities and, and hope for the future of what's going to happen with that. You know, if these instructional design is improving overall, it's going to be so much better for people with disabilities. You know, e-learning just in what it is, learning at your own pace on the computer, already opens the door for so many more people with uh, different neurodivergences and physical disabilities of getting to places. And, and so... On top of that, you also have uh, these technologies that can be used in, in, in a very good way in terms of instructional design, mm -hmm. where you can create uh, experiences and learning experiences uh, that's, that's just more open for everyone. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think instructional, uh, instructional technology is really... Uh, a, a great way to to learn different ways of connecting with learners with disabilities, learners right. without disabilities, just learners in general. That's awesome. I'm so I'm so happy to hear that you believe that instructional technology is going in the right direction and and has a huge opportunity for increasing accessibility and that just needs to go in the direction that it's going. Do you believe that in terms of then having disability and having these mental health issues, it's kind of giving you any advantages or disadvantages in the instructional technology industry? Do you believe that that's changed you yeah. in some way? Yeah, so I, I think uh, 
the way that my disability has interacted with my life has always been one where I had to like innovate and think of new ways to solve problems. When I was a math teacher, I needed to get a, a wireless tablet so that I could write on the board. Um, no one told me the idea. No one suggested that to me. Those were just things that I came up with and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of figured out what I had to do. Uh, so, so yeah, and the same is true with like instructional technology and things like that. Uh, it kind of puts everyone into a world where they kind of have to figure out what to do because this technology is a new thing to everybody. And and so it's it, it's it's nice because to be able to solve problems with people and and have a common a common goal. Uh, yeah, whereas before I was just like, you know, adapting and finding ways to figure out my own problems, the instructional technology reframes everything as a common goal that we all have uh, to make good instructional design right. with technology for accessibility. Would you argue then instructional technology is actually ahead of now, ahead of their time when comparing it to how in your experience as a student and a teacher in m multiple environments, you think it's more ahead in terms of inclusivity and accessibility? I think the theories that I have learned in the MATE program and the the way of thinking about teaching and instructing learners in this program with the tech, the focus on technology, I think it is the way that the future should and will go. I think, I think thinking about it in this way does give people an advantage. It is, a, it's ahead of the traditional uh, style in terms of this is probably how things are going to develop in the future. Now, I, I will say the traditional style of, of teaching and instructing is really valuable. And, and that style of uh, uh, like that disciplinary, uh, strong, like behavior forming style is something that's like really useful and, and it can help. And there's a there's a place for like, and an appreciation in my heart for people who can do that. I do value those people a lot. I, I think it's amazing. But at the same time, I also think that the technology in education is going to open doors for accessibility for everything. I feel like there's a really interesting conversation right now with the COVID pandemic, where I feel that there's a lot more conversations than, other, than ever before with accessibility in regular classrooms versus online classrooms. Because I feel on one hand, it actually created a lot of accessibility booms because now all of a sudden, all of these online technologies, social technologies made learning a lot easier for a lot of people. But on the other hand, I've seen issues where, for example, people on the autism spectrum really struggled because they were used to the schedule of going to school every day and had having the behavioral specialists helping them out when they needed help or people with an IEP, like it, it was harder to keep track of those who were, who were improve, who were improving as social learners or physical learners. So do you think that maybe your world might be going? Do you think that you are going to be part of the movement of potentially hybrid education? Or do you plan to maybe look into education that is virtual based in terms of like what i'm going to do in the short term i definitely am going to try adjunct teaching so that would be in person um oh. in terms of like the future and like the ideal idea in my head of where these things would go mm -hmm. i think ideally it would be like a case-by-case -case, uh, scenario so that there would be an option for hybrid there would be an option for in person there would be an option for e-learning only. I appreciate a lot that you mentioned the thing about uh, certain people with autism who struggled with its schedule changes. The way forward isn't one way or the other. It's somewhere in the middle and meeting people where they where they need to be met. Do you think that schools are going to be struggling with that, you think? Or do you think that right now, from what you've been seeing from potentially f fellow peers who are into teaching or just by seeing what's been going on in the news, you think that it's just going to go back to what it was originally? I think um, when I was reading uh, Alan's book about e-learning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the author often exclaims how a lot of people are choosing e-learning because it's cheaper 
and mm. that can cause all kinds of problems. Um, so yeah, I think I think we're seeing the effects of that. We saw the effects of that a lot when the pandemic hit, and mm. it's going to continue on. Yeah, um, but but I think as time goes on and more e learning happens, it's inevitable that the the design will get at least a little bit better. Uh, maybe that's overly optimistic. But Wait, yeah, I'm, cro- I'm crossing my fingers. I'm crossing <laughs> my fingers that you know the problems that people are calling out improve. That's what I'd say is you know the world we live in is is kind of chaotic. So <laughs> you know things things are gonna be a little crazy. But at the end of the day, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the future. I'm I'm hopeful mm-hmm. as well. What do you think are your biggest challenges as a mate learner right now? Mate. In my experience, it really is what you make of it. There's a lot of like experiences in me that kind of weren't what I was expecting in most classes in terms of like the type of learning that happens. If you're going into me, I think the biggest thing you can do is just put your best foot forward and trying to get the most you can out of each and every class because right. it is asynchronous, a lot of them. And it is online learning. The learning and the stuff really is kind of somewhat placed on you. If you put the extra effort in, read every little part of the book and, you know, take your notes and, and and if you really put your best foot forward, you're going to get a lot out of it. Biggest struggle with it at the beginning of me was, you know, as I was in this depression, I was, you know, having a hard time seeing the value and the things that I was doing. And then as time gone on and I went through therapy and, and I, I, I helped help myself out uh, emotionally and mentally, uh, now I'm in a place where I can really take a lot from these classes and I can, I can you know, get these valuable ideas and, and, and skills. I find that really important to put your best foot forward and just prepare for a wide variety of situations. One of the biggest strengths of meat, but also one of the bigger challenges of meat for those who are used to more traditional degrees is how, because it's asynchronous and there's a lot of different subjects being taught where you could be doing a wide variety of different concepts you're learning from week to week. There's a lot of changes that you have to constantly adapt to that you can't prepare for sometimes. And then, like you said, Take in the wonderful learning community that we have a mate, you know, utilize the power of feedback like you'd learn from dreams. I think that there's a lot of power in that. I, I, I think there's a, a lot of power in that. This is just a random uh, question that I have. What bug would you choose for your learning style? Because you have a spider video game. I think I'd choose a dragonfly. Really? That's, Why? That's just what comes into my head. So if you've ever seen a dragonfly fly around, it kind of darts in between different positions really quickly. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I am. I like having my mind in many different areas on different days. So like on a Monday, maybe I'll be in Blender modeling something and like learning that. And then on a Tuesday, maybe I'll be uh making a game mechanic or like on Thursday maybe I'll be learning about music you know things like that so I I I guess the visual image that popped into my mind was like a dragonfly like flying to different things so yeah that's the bug I would pick interesting and then is there any monster because you said you like monsters that you would use to describe how you see yourself in the next five years i'm gonna choose the kraken Ooh. as my monster Ooh. why yeah very scary but you know i'm not thinking of it that way i'm thinking of it like it's got like so many tentacles and it's got so many goals and it's like reaching for different things at all at once you know <laughs> like I, i'm very like a long-term person like i like having like these goals and then I work a little bit towards them, you know, and, and then in five years, I hope to have achieved maybe one or two of these goals, but I hope that I have more goals, you know, so many tentacles, many goals. Hey, that rhymes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's pretty much all of the questions that I have. Do you have any takeaways that you would like to? to let our lovely listeners know about yeah um (laughs) i guess 
take a look in your dreams. You know, you don't necessarily have to buy it. Just take a look. You know, I think it's really cool. Maybe you could use it as some sort of educational thing. <laughs> but, you know, uh, on a more serious note, the most important things I said today was, um, you know, if you're doing the main program, make sure you go with your best foot forward. And um, when it comes to game design and educational game design, make sure you do what you're really passionate about uh, in terms of like the subject and and the, the specific uh, instructional goal that you want to that you want to achieve with the game. Make sure it's something that like you really love teaching and love doing because a game right. is a huge undertaking. So if you don't like the 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 thing that you're teaching in the game, it's not going to go very far. So yeah, I guess those are the the summary like type of things that I'd like to throw out there. That's perfect. And uh, honestly, if the last takeaway fits the would you learn this part of Michael Allen's mm -hmm. seven success exactly. strategies, I, I think a big takeaway from the instructional design side from what we talked about is take a look at Addy for anything that you're planning, including video games. It's a really great planning tool uh also nick mentioned just be be aware of what fits your skill levels be very aware of that and definitely keep that in mind when you're helping your learners as well and then a final takeaway would be look at look at malcolm knowles's adult learning principles it is amazing and eye-opening it has certainly helped me become a better learner and a better instructional designer so definitely take a look especially motivation the last principle uh, amazing and that's pretty much it. So I'm Elizabeth Rivera. This was Meet to Mate User with Nick Brennan. We're signing off now. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for having me. Firstly, I would like to thank Dr. Ackerman and the Graduate Studies Department for giving me the opportunity to work as a graduate assistant for the Mate Facebook page, as well as giving me the opportunity to create the segment in the first place. Without them, this segment wouldn't be possible. Additionally, I would like to thank Nicholas Brennan for coming on the segment and telling their amazing story. Finally, I would like to thank you, the wonderful listeners, who took the time out of your day to listen to our podcast. Like I said in the intro segment, if you have any thoughts about today's segment, please let us know. I'm Elizabeth Rivera, and I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, and night.